Hello everyone. Welcome back to Real Life Struggles. Today I'm going to give the blog reaction one more try. But you can see I've got a better camera. I've got a better microphone. And we're going to look at a blog that's probably a bit more interesting to most people. We're going to be looking at Answers in Genesis talking about Adam and Eve. All right. So who were Adam and Eve? Well, Adam and Eve are listed in the Bible as the first humans that God made. Whether that is, as young earth creationists say, which I disagree with, they were literally the very first humans created, and they were created only about 6,000 years ago. Was it a special creation from an old earth perspective? That's one I did hold for quite a long time. And I'm not really so sure anymore. Or did God use evolution to create everything? And Adam and Eve were two people that he pulled out of, you know, a mix of people. And he gave them a special purpose. And they unfortunately didn't listen. And the last one that quite a lot of people who believe in evolution and believe in God at the same time, they might say Adam and Eve weren't real people. They were just a Jewish story. So let's keep looking. How do the latest scientific discoveries support the biblical account of Adam and Eve? Uh, they probably don't. The only way that I would say that they do hold to it would be if you hold a theistic evolution. Science does say by tracing both mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome DNA, that we do have a common ancestor. Uh, the time frame between the two is dropping down, but they don't go to the, you know, the exact same year or date like would be required. What are the answers to the major questions concerning humanity's first parents? Uh, I don't know. Let's keep going. All right, Adam and Eve were real people, but because the best accounts of Adam and Eve are found in the Bible, many critics challenge their existence. Well, here's the thing. If you're going to make a claim about anything, you know, the sky is blue, gravity exists, Adam and Eve were real people, you got to show some evidence. And we have pretty good evidence the sky is blue. I mean, unless you're blue-green colorblind, we can look outside and see the sky is blue. We know that something is keeping us on the earth and not floating away and also keeps the earth from flying off into space. So we do know gravity is real, but we do know there's a force that's real and we call that gravity. But to scientifically claim that Adam and Eve are real people, we need to show some kind of evidence outside the Bible. The Bible is very good as a theological book, it's not so good as a scientific book. And real scientists aren't going to listen to Adam and Eve are real because I have a book that says they're real. Sorry, Answers in Genesis. Throughout the years, opponents to the historicity of Adam and Eve have challenged the biblical record on several fronts. Well, they should. That's what science does. Science always challenges itself to make sure that what we're saying is scientifically real is actually scientifically accurate. There's plenty of examples in the past. People used to think the earth was flat, and we discovered that's not true a long time ago. People also used to think the earth was the center of the universe. We built a telescope and found out that we're actually orbiting the sun. Often because of evolutionary thought, many claim that they were mythological or allegorical figures with no basis in actual history. But are they right? Here's the thing. Coming from a young earth creationist background, I once did believe they were completely real and they were formed 6,000 years ago and that all of the evidence that the earth is much older must be wrong. And through a long journey, I've come out of young earth creationism but when it comes to the theory of evolution, I'm still a bit agnostic on it. 
on the one hand, things change. That's obvious. Look at humans from even a few thousand years ago. We're much different. Look at all the food that we eat. Look at all the animals that we have. Um, look at how dogs came from wolves. And now we have tiny little poodles that we can put in a cute little purse. So there's no question that evolution is happening. The question that myself, because of my lack of education growing up in a young earth creationist school, and probably many others struggle with, is can we explain the vast diversity of all life as being attributed to evolution? Or over a few million to billion years, did God just plunk stuff down? And, you know, proponents of evolution say, well, you know, that's because things evolve from one thing to another. And other people say, well, you know, things change once they're on Earth, but God is one to put them there. Uh, personally, I'm still studying. I'm pretty close to just pulling the trigger and saying evolution is true, but I haven't gotten there yet, honestly. Our aim is to examine Adam and Eve from the Bible, consider some of the theological implications to believing in a real Adam and Eve, and finally address some of the major challenges to the historicity of the first humans. Hmm, here's the thing. I've dealt with a lot of young earth creationist people. I've read a lot of young earth creationist stuff. That was actually part of my journey out, was just to read everything that AIG said about stuff and to read everything people wrote about an old earth until I made the decision. But I've dealt with people like this for long enough to know that while they'll say we're going to provide scientific evidence, they're just going to provide a lot of pseudoscience and say that scientifically we should believe it because the Bible says it so, which I feel that's a disservice to the Bible itself and a disservice to science. Let's see what they have to say. Biblical record. Who were Adam and Eve? According to scripture, Adam and Eve were the first humans on the planet. In Genesis, we are told God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. Genesis 2, 7. This man called Adam is the first human being, but God did not create Adam to be alone. We read further along. All right, we'll get to that in a minute. Here's the thing, and there is a possibility that I'm wrong, but from what I have read... The word from is actually inserted into the English translations, but wasn't there in the Hebrew translations. So in English, it reads that God created him from the dust of the ground, but it should actually read more like God created man, he was dust. And while that might not seem like that big of a change, what it actually should be saying is that God created man and he was mortal when he created them. The phrase, he was dust, uh, you know, like the phrase ashes, ashes, dust to dust, you know, from dust you came, from dust you'll return. So it's not really saying what God made Adam out of. It's trying to state how God created Adam, that he was created as a mortal being which kind of flies in the face of a lot of young earth creationist things where they're talking about how Adam was created perfectly and Adam was immortal until he sinned and then sin brought death upon everything. Everything was perfect before Adam sinned. Yeah, not true. Okay. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. While he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. But here's another thing. The word translated rib, it's not talking about this little bone here on the side of you. Better would be stated, God split Adam in half and made a woman out of him. So, if we're going to take this story literally, then God literally cut Adam in half, made half 
of Adam into a woman, and Adam somehow still survived that. I mean, it's just like a Wolverine Deadpool thing where he just regrew everything. Did God magically make Adam whole again? If you really, you know, study the culture the Bible is written in, a lot of us take it literally just is impossible. Let's keep reading. In the plain reading, now plain reading to young earth creationists means we read it however we want to read it so that it means the things that we've already decided it means. They don't do any kind of external research. They don't look at what did the original society that told the story, the original society that wrote the story. No, it's what does it say in English, and if it matches what we already believe, then great. If it doesn't match what we already believe, then we make some things up so that it does match what we already believe. You might notice that I've ranted against that a lot on my channel, because that's the exact opposite of how scientific discovery works. Scientific discovery, you propose an idea, and then you gather evidence, and the evidence that's against it you consider it, and if there's more evidence against it than there is evidence for it, then for the time, you declare it's not true. When you do gather more evidence that shows that it might actually be true, you know, like I said before, the Earth being the center of the universe versus the Earth rotating around the sun. Once we are able to discover and make a telescope, we learn new information and we change the way we thought about stuff. All right, so in the plain reading of Genesis 1 to 3, we learn that God created the first two people, Adam and Eve. They were placed in the Garden of Eden and giving everything they needed, food, work, companionship, and the fellowship with God as they walked with him in the cool of the day. It was perfect, almost. Well, it wasn't perfect because the earth wasn't created perfectly. The earth was created good. And there's a major difference in Hebrew language between perfect and good. The word used for good multiple times in the creation story is tov, or tov, as in mazel tov, good fortune. And the word tov doesn't mean that everything is created perfectly. It means that what was made or whatever is good, is accomplishing the purpose it was created for. The earth was created for humans to work. So Adam didn't just sit around with magical grapes being fed into his mouth. He would have had to work the garden. He would have had to grow his food. This is all assuming this is a literal story. So right away, we're getting stuff wrong. Let's keep going. Then something happened, oh no. A serpent entered the Garden of Eden to tempt Adam and Eve. God had given food from every tree in the garden, but commanded the man and woman not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Eve believed the serpent, ate the fruit, then gave it to Adam, who also ate of the fruit, which comes from Genesis 3.6. Now here's the thing. Again, let's go back to either Adam and Eve were real and lived a long time ago, or Adam and Eve are part of the theological lesson, and they weren't real. Either way, it probably wasn't a literal talking snake that told Adam and Eve not to do something. It probably was God gave them a command, and then they disobeyed the command. And as part of the Jewish story... They needed some kind of tempter, some kind of bad person that's just whispering in their ear to tell them what to do. The event was catastrophic. Now known as the fall, God judged Adam and Eve for disobeying his command, and true to his word, Adam and Eve began the process of death. The Bible tells us that Adam lived 930 years, then he died, Genesis 5.5. Oh yes, and let's look at the dinosaurs that are now eating each other despite the fact that dinosaurs died like 65 million years ago. But here's the thing. It doesn't say in the Bible that on the day of the, on the day that you eat of the fruit, 
you shall begin to die. It says, on the day that you eat the fruit, you will die. So if we're taking this as a literal story, a plain literal reading, as they said earlier in the blog, then shouldn't they have died that day? I, I want to say I heard somebody say, the Hebrew translates to something like, dying you shall die. Maybe a scholar, somebody that knows a bit more than me can chime in on this, but seems to me the Bible says they're supposed to die that day. And anything that explains it away, uh, it's not a literal reading. So you can't take this story literally and also try to explain something figuratively. And here's the other part. The thing about the Long Ages is Jewish people like to tell stories. They like to exaggerate their stories, kind of like the fish that you caught that keeps getting bigger. It was really common in that time. The Sumerian kings lived for 30,000 years. I think sometimes a few hundred thousand years. No one's going to read any of those stories and say they're supposed to be literal. They're going to take them to be figuratively, just like we should take these stories. If the society that wrote the story didn't take it literally, then why should we? All right, the theological importance of a historical Adam and Eve. Well, there isn't one. The purpose of the story is to tell people that God told some humans what they should and shouldn't do. They didn't listen to God, and they did something they weren't supposed to. Now we have this sin that's keeping us away from God, and later God's going to fix the problem. Whether Adam and Eve are 6,000 years old, or 200,000 years old, or just a made-up people in the story, it doesn't really matter as for a theological outlook. God made man. Man separated from God. God sent somebody to bring us back to God. And in the very end, the relationship between God and earth is going to be perfect. Way sometime in the future. That's all it's saying. Okay, since their sin, every other person born after them must plunge into rebellion against God's order. That includes you and every other human being you know. And this rebellion is also the reason why we die today. Through Adam's sin, death came into the world. Wrong! And I've spoken about this before. Here, let me put the verse up. Romans 5, 12. It doesn't say that death came to the entire world. It says that death came to man. So that means animals and plants and bugs and bacteria. They all would have died before this story takes place. But Jesus demonstrated he has power over death. Jesus came, lived, was crucified, and rose from the dead. Okay, I'm going to agree with him on that one. Those who are in Christ will not have to suffer the internal consequences of sin. Through Adam, sin entered the world, but through Christ, we can be saved from the punishment of sin. Okay, no problem there. That's basically what I was trying to say before. That's why a historical Adam and Eve are so important. If you deny a real Adam and Eve, many of the doctrines of the Bible, including the gospel, would be incoherent. On many occasions, New Testament author... Okay, I'm going to stop there. Then we'll... Right. So if you deny a real Adam and Eve, many of the doctrines in the Bible would be incoherent. No, they're not. You tell people that God created humans, but humans rebelled against God and don't want to be with him. So God sent somebody to bring you back. You don't have to know anything at all about the Old Testament. Do you think when people go to these remote tribes where people have never seen another person in their entire life. Do you think any of these people have to be told about Adam and Eve and Moses and the flood and a seven-day creation before they can accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Or do you just go to these people and say, hey, guess what? 
I know you worship these other gods, but our God is the God above all gods. All these other gods are fake. And if you accept that he sent Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can spend eternal life with God. There's no Adam and Eve required in this, people. On many occasions, New Testament authors connect a historic Adam and Eve to a foundational doctrine, and it does not make sense if Adam and Eve were mythological. I don't agree, because Adam and Eve would have been known throughout the ancient world, all the way from Old Testament times up to first century uh, Roman you know, occupation of Judea times. So these are people and characters of a story that would have been well known. It's not much different than if preachers now started talking about Lord of the Rings. Yes, I, I bring this up a lot in my videos because I really like the story. I think it's a great story. And so in this Lord of the Rings, you know, we have evil. We have Saruman. We have Sauron. Spoiler alerts for 25-year-old movies and, you know, very old books. But we have these characters that disembody evil. We have people like Frodo that embody goodness and wanting to do well. We have Samwise Gamgee, who's, to me, one of the best descriptions of how to be the perfect friend. And if preachers for years and years and years and years were always preaching sermons based on this story, it doesn't mean that these characters have to be real in the story in order for these lessons to hold. I could do an entire video tomorrow about how Aragorn is the best king ever. It doesn't mean he's real. He doesn't have to be real in order to learn lessons from them. Considering the following passages that refer back to historic Adam and Eve. Okay, I don't have the entire Bible memorized, uh, but Jesus affirms the special creation of Adam and Eve at the beginning, Mark 10, 6. That one's actually wrong. Let's look it up. All right, let's read this from the King James Version, because it's the first one that came up. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Okay, so at a cursory reading, you might think, all right, hey, they're right. They're talking about the beginning of creation. But let's look at Mark 10 itself. Mark 10, talking about Jesus. And he arose from thence. Okay, I gotta, we're gonna change this to something that's a little bit more modern. Let's read the first part. Teaching about divorce, not teaching about the beginning of the world. He arose and went from the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. The Pharisees came to test him. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And going down to the bottom, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what therefore God has joined together, not let man put asunder. It's talking about marriage and divorce, people. Jesus connects the human lineage of Jesus to Adam, Luke 3, 3, 8. This one's a little bit harder for me, which is why I haven't made the decision on are they real or not. But it goes back to if there are people that in the story were real, then as you're making a genealogy of Jesus for Jewish people, you're going to link it back to people that are in the story in order to show people it's the Messiah that was promised to them. Paul connects the doctrine of the church to Adam and Eve. Right, this is an interesting one. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I'm speaking about Christ in the church. Hmm, I don't see a historical Adam and Eve here. Let's try another version. Maybe the English Standard Version. 
because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying it refers to Christ in the church. I still don't see Adam and Eve here. Look at the full chapter. Walk in love. All right. This is a chapter about how to treat husbands and wives. Nothing to do with Adam and Eve. Nice try. Paul argues for family order because of Adam and Eve. Well, the last one was completely made up. But maybe this one will actually say something useful. For man was not made from woman, but woman for man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, the Lord woman, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. As for as a woman was made for man, so now man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. Okay, we'll give you this one. It doesn't directly say Adam and Eve, but it's talking about the creation story. But again, like I said before, there are people that are important. The Bible's mostly a Jewish story. Paul attaches the origin of sin in the world to Eve. Okay, I'll have to look up that verse because it probably just says Eve sinned. Um, again, that's the Jewish explanation for how sin came into the world. It doesn't matter if the story really happened, if it's important to the Jewish people and it's in the Old Testament. Paul also connects death from sin to Adam. Well, yeah, that's the whole reason we're all in trouble right now, because we didn't listen to God when he told us to do something and not to do something else. Adam and Eve being real doesn't matter, because... Adam and Eve being real has nothing to do with you and I choosing to do things that we were told not to. By connecting, their real, by connecting to their real existence and activities, the New Testament overwhelmingly affirms the historicity of Adam and Eve. It's not possible to deny real Adam and Eve while at the same time believing the rest of the Bible. Hence, it is vital to believe in actual Adam and Eve to remain, maintain a coherent biblical theology. Yes, so what they're saying there is we decided everything was literal. So if you don't decide everything was literal, then nothing else works. That only works if you believe the way we do that makes everything literal. It's kind of a bunch of circular stuff. If you accept the fact that the Bible was written thousands of years ago by people that thought differently than we do, then everything still works if you don't accept it as literal. Because none of the people in the story probably accepted it as literal. They accepted it as their explanation for how things happened. Paul underscores why a historical Adam is so important. For as an Adam all die, so also in Christ shall be made alive. Yeah, you know what Adam means? Adam just means human. I'm not a Hebrew expert or a Greek expert, but it probably could also read this way. For as all humans die, so also in Christ shall be made alive. The apostle said that we suffer the consequences of our sin because of a real Adam. No, we suffer the consequences of our sin because we choose to continue sinning. But also that in a real Christ, we can overcome a real death and be reconciled with the real God. Yeah, I agree. And I could go preach a sermon tomorrow and invite people to become Christians. Never once mention Adam. And it would probably still work. But not everyone believes the Bible bought Adam and Eve. Well, yeah, not everyone that believes in the Bible believes the same way you do, dude. There are many attempted challenges to the history and theology connected to a real Adam and Eve. Here are some of the most more popular disagreements with the Bible account of her first parents. Well, yeah, because most people to believe something want to see some kind of evidence. Weren't Adam and Eve mythological figures? Evolutionary thought permeates our culture. Well, actually, science permeates our culture because we're a scientific culture. 
That's just kind of how it is. In its most popular form, evolutionists, I don't like that word, argue for the common descent of human beings from other animals or human-like creatures. I mean, that's mostly true. Evolution states that somewhere a long time ago, a few million years ago, an ape-like creature split off from some other ape-like creatures, which eventually evolved to be humans. According to them, Adam and Eve cannot have been created in the way a plain reading, plain reading meaning read it the way we do or you're wrong, of Genesis 1-2 suggests since modern humans evolved from pre-existing creatures. These critics seek to mythologize or allegorize the narrative of the first few chapters of Genesis. Well, because that's the way the people thought back then. They thought in allegories. Have you ever read the New Testament? Consider the mustard seed. It's the smallest seed ever. A man once traveled and was attacked by some bad people. And it was the Jew that helped the Samaritan. I mean, it's all allegory. For instance, when recounting the narrative of Adam and Eve, the Washington Post proposed, first, the story existed as a myth, inspired in part by the Babylonian creation story. Then St. Augustine made it fact, and biblical literism reigned for centuries until the Enlightenment. When representation of the couple in art and literature became so accurate that they seemed too human, too real, people started asking questions. And before long, secularism and science turned the story back into myth. I'm going to agree with part of that, because reading John Walton, it seems that the Jewish people, the ancient Jewish people, did start telling the story because of Babylonian creation myths, because they're telling their story to counteract the other myths. The thing is, all of these other gods, they existed within the same kind of, let's say, universe as the humans did. They weren't around before the creation of, you know, everything. And the stories were stuff like, you know, some guy sneezed and his snot became stars. They worship these stars. They worship these other gods. And the Jews rolled around and said, look, there's one God. He exists outside of time, space, and matter. And he created everything that there is, and he created it for us. He didn't create humans to serve gods. God created us because he wanted a relationship with us. So there's some truth in that. Young Earth creationism is not as old as Young Earth creationism likes to promote. It's actually kind of a modern invention. But is that accurate? This does not read the Bible as an integrated whole. I think you guys should read the Bible as an integrated whole and not cherry pick single verses out of a chapter to prove your point. The biblical authors knew what mythology was. On numerous occasions, they clearly distinguished historical fact from mythology. Right, so 1 Timothy 4, 7, have nothing to do with irrelevant, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. I'm not a Bible expert, so I don't know exactly what to say about this. But to me, this is more don't chase after the myths of other cultures. Not so much don't make up stories to explain your own God. And then we have Second Peter 1.16, where we did not follow cleverly decided devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we are eyewitness of his majesty. Um, you have to think about the fact, too, this, that the New Testament was around when the Greeks and Romans were around. They had multiple gods. They had these myths about their gods. So to me, this is more saying don't follow the mythological nature of the world around you. Follow God. So when the Bible itself argues for the historic veracity of Adam and Eve, as Jesus, Luke, and Paul did, see above, like I said, I don't really think it does, but you're welcome to believe the wrong thing. Later teachers may have also affirmed the reality of Adam and Eve, but so did the authors of the scripture before them. And again, if any of you guys watching this that are young earth creationists, you want to chime in in the comments why you think that they're correct, you can, but I don't think they are. 
Wasn't Genesis 1 to 11 poetry? Yes, it was. It reads like poetry, especially the creation myth. It reads like poetry. It repeats itself. It has things, it has repetition that makes it easy to remember and pass on. Because you got to remember, these stories were around long, long before people knew how to write. Another similar challenge to the historicity of Adam and Eve relates to the genre of Genesis. Another similar challenge to the historicity of Adam and Eve relates to the genre of Genesis. In other words, we shouldn't believe Adam and Eve were real people because we find the primary account of their lives in a poetic section of scripture. According to this view, Adam and Eve were merely poetic devices. Uh, so here's the thing. When it comes to the young earth creationist world, if they want it to be poetry, it's poetry. If they want it to be literal, it's literal. If anyone else states that lit what they think is literal is actually poetry, then young earth creationists call them heretics. Like the first challenge, this argument doesn't work for the same reasons. Jesus and other New Testament authors refer to Adam and Eve as historical figures. Well, Jesus and them also referred to people that are never talked about in the Bible that are actually in extra biblical books from the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha was rejected for not being the word of God, so it's possible that the people in those stories weren't real. They were allegorical figures. So which one is it? Is everyone that Jesus and the apostles refer to real? Or is it possible that some of the people they refer to were made up for the story. To deny the historicity of Adam and Eve by turning them into literary characters, one must also deny what Jesus taught. And there's the Mark 10, 6 again. Sorry, dude. I'll end the dinosaurs. I love that. That dinosaur would be so hungry and would be eating everyone. Dr. Terry Mortison also agrees when he said, the early chapters of Genesis are not poetry, a series of parables or prophetic visions or mythology. Chapters recount God's acts in space, time, history, acts of creation, providence, and redemption. When we insist that 1 through 11 is history, we're not saying the section of the Bible is only history. That it was inspired to satisfy some of our curiosities about our origins. It is far more than history, for it teaches theology, morality, and redemption, and those truths are vitally important. But it's not less than history, and what it teaches on the latter themes is rooted in the history. I'm going to agree with part of that and disagree with others. I mean, I hate to agree with people that have a doctorate. I don't know what his doctorate's in. I'll look it up when I'm done with the video and put it on the screen. But the thing is, like I said before, it doesn't have to be history in order to be important. Why didn't Adam and Eve immediately die? Yeah, I asked that before. I wonder why. Yet another challenge is an internal critique of Genesis. God promised Adam and Eve on a certain judgment if they ate the forbidden fruit. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat it, you shall surely die. Yeah, that's the one that I said in Hebrew. It says something like, in the day you die, you shall surely die. You're dying. Something like that. How is one supposed to reconcile the fact God promised a particular judgment for a particular sin with a judgment that was not fulfilled? Put another way, why didn't they die immediately? Bodhi Hodge addresses this contradiction, supposed contradiction. The Hebrew is literally die, die, with two different verb tenses, dying and die, which can be translated as surely die or dying you shall die. Hey, thanks, that's what I was trying to say earlier. This indicates the beginning of dying in an ingressive sense, which finally culminates with death. At that point, Adam and Eve began to die and returned to dust. They were meant to die right then. The text should have simply used moa, moath, muath, sorry, my Hebrew, which means dead, died, or die, and not beginning to die, or surely die. As moath, moath was used in Hebrew, Old Testament authors understood this and use it in such a fashion, but we must remember that English translations can miss something. Yes, we should remember that, Mr. Ken Ham, that English translations can miss a lot 
of things, and we shouldn't base our entire theological and scientific outlook on reading the Bible in English. All right, so it looks like there is some, maybe I misunderstood it earlier. Uh, still, others have challenged the historical record in that Adam could not have possibly named all the animal species in one day. Adam named all the animals on day six. And he must have named all the animals in one day because that was the rationale for God creating the woman. Now out of the ground, the Lord God has formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. That would be Genesis 2.19. There are currently millions of species on earth. The question is, how could Adam have named all of the animals in a single day? The narrative strains at believability. We have to believe Adam named millions of animals in less than one day. First day, God named all the animals created at that time. It is likely God. It is likely that Adam had to name only a couple thousand protospecies of land animals, a task which could have easily been achieved in a few hours. Assuming Adam had to name 2,500 protospecies or kinds, one of these days, somebody in young earth creationism is going to define what a kind is. I don't think that day's tomorrow. At five seconds per animal, it would have taken him approximately three and a half hours to complete the task. This was doable even for a person today. That's ridiculous. Seriously. Five seconds per animal. Have you read and studied what the Hebrew names of animals are, Mr. Kinham? Names that describe the animal? Names that describe how the animal Acted? Do you think Adam could have gotten this in five seconds per animal? Did you name your kids in five seconds? Utterly ridiculous. Isn't human DNA 99% similar to chimps? Yeah, it is. Others have challenged the possibility of Adam and Eve on a evolutionary grounds. They contend that human DNA is similar. So similar to chimpanzee DNA, thus making our first parents unnecessary. Mainstream numbers change, but studies have suggested that human and chimp DNA is about 95 to 99% similar. Is that possible? Well, when millions and millions of scientists study something and all came to the same conclusion, usually it is possible. Taking the more reliable results provided by the earlier blast inversion corroborated by the whole chromosome alignments of the nuclear attained in the study is likely the 88% similarity numbers are considerably more accurate than the other methods to date. Additionally, studies show that chimps have a genome size 8% larger, so the actual similarity, even using the high end estimate, of 88% is realistically only about 80%. Well, here's the thing. And again, this is... Young Earth creationism cherry-picking things to fit their narrative. The 80%, 88%, and then the 95 to 99%, it's measuring two different things. And I've actually read a couple things about it. Unfortunately, uh, you know, genetics and stuff like that is not my specialty. So I'm not going to try to explain it. I'll try to throw a link up somewhere so that you guys can uh, see the difference between the two. But I guess maybe kind of like measuring horsepower versus torque and then arguing which two cars have the same amount of power between them. But anyway, 80% is still a lot of similarity between two things. Other scientific evidence for historical are Adam and Eve. The Bible affirms that historic accounts of Adam and Eve However, there's even more scientific literature that confirms the historicity of our first parents. In a well-documented presentation, Dr. Georgiana Purdom, let's look her up later. I'll put in here what her actual PhD and whether or not she's a young earth creationist. Outlines some of the reasons we should trust the Bible when it talks about Adam and Eve. Well, this appears to be a broken link to a video. What evidence there is, but it would have been nice if he just listed a couple sentences I could have read. 
Conclusion, why are Adam and Eve so important? They're important because they're important to the people that wrote the Bible. That's why. The Bible confirms the historicity of Adam and Eve. Well, you think it does. Some people like me are in disagreement about that. And again, I'm not denying that they were real. I'm just denying that it's 110% important that they are. Moreover, there's nothing in scientific research that has been able to disprove the existence of Adam and Eve. That's rich. Because number one, you guys don't do scientific research. You search for evidence to support something you've already concluded on. And there's a lot of scientific research that would disprove how a historical Adam and Eve, the existence of Adam and Eve. Uh, the fact that you think they were alive 6,000 years ago and they were the fierce humans, when in fact anatomically modern humans have been around for a few hundred thousand years. Uh, the fact that pretty much all of science states that evolution is how we explain the diversity of life and evolution wouldn't have created a pair of humans. It would have created many proto-humans that eventually became the Homo sapiens sapiens that we are. Even the mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam, it's not leading back to a pair of people. It's just leading back to two separate people who probably lived at different times, but we can trace all of our genetic information back to. Sorry, man. Most importantly, the gospel is dependent upon an actual Adam and Eve. No, it's not. It's dependent on man sinning and turning away from God, which we did. How that happened thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years ago doesn't matter. We see a historical Adam and Eve connected to the promised Messiah. When God judged the serpent after the fall, there's a glimmer of hope he hid in the judgment. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Well, yeah, God says that God will turn human and come to earth. How humans became humans has nothing to do with God becoming human and going to earth. Theologians understand this offspring of the woman to be none other than Jesus Christ, just as Eve found hope in God's promised offspring, so also we look to God's promised offspring of redemption. Well, at least it ends on something true. Jesus was the offspring of human people. And it came from the Jewish line. Whether that Jewish line goes all the way back to a real historic, actually existed Adam and Eve, or it just goes back into who knows, and they made up some stories. Throughout the years, opponents to the historic present for nah, let's try again. These critics seek to mythologize, mythologize, 